ladies and gentlemen, to BTC Presents the Raw Rewind. Now, I know it's WWE has already put the trademark on the Raw Rewind, and it's something that I'm playing around with in terms of what we're actually going to call it. So this week it's the Raw Rewind, and I am your host, Ray, and my co-host this week, Chris Adams. Chris, how are you? Doing good, Ray. How are you doing tonight? Good. It seems to flip-flop. You know, one minute you're the host and I'm the co-host. Next minute I'm the host and you're the co-host. You know, it just kind of goes back and forth. It makes it fun. You know, I, I, I think that when it comes to Monday nights and Tuesday nights, that these are just, you know, really down your alley here. So I'm completely okay with you being the man on Monday and Tuesday nights. Works for me. Works for me. By the way, for all for those of you that managed to listen in last night, um, you guys got quite the spectacle towards the end of it, and uh, it was a it was a one and done. It was the end of an era. Uh, we are retiring the rated R era of um, Body Slam the competition. We're we're leaning more towards a family friendly atmosphere. So for those of you that got the opportunity to listen in on that show, whoo boy was that. Uh, let's just say towards the end of it, I was I was laughing so hard I was in tears. But uh, for those that didn't, um, unfortunately, uh, you're not going to be able to hear it because it's 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 lost in space somewhere, and you can blame Mr. Adams for that one. <laughs> Darth Darth Vader himself, Chris Adams, has gone in and deleted last night's show because it just seemed like a truly hot mess that. I really would not want my worst enemy to go back and try to listen to again. We had some fun with it, no doubt. I'm not going to lie. We had some fun. It was funny. I laughed. They laughed. Uh, from a business perspective, I guess, I thought we might have to tune, you know, tone it down a little bit, and I couldn't keep it on there, basically. But Yeah, more, but, more or less, we were not prepared. We were kind of... We kind of yes. went in with a lot of unprofessionalism <laughs> last night. Uh, Nobody take, was prepared for what happened. And I blame Mike. I think, I actually, no, I blame Dustin. Because <laughs> Dustin's not going to call him tonight. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a, a lot of it does fall on me as far as that goes. The night before, I was like, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to talk about? We need a topic. And we threw it together last second night before. Nobody had time to research anything. It didn't turn out that well. There wasn't a lot of news to cover for the week that was interesting. So it just was not great. I think if it's okay with you guys, though, in a couple of weeks, three weeks, something like that, I'd like to revisit the family lineage part and at least give us time to prepare for it and talk about it the right way and everything at least. I I still think it can be a good show if we just don't get there and go like, hey, man, you know these dudes are brothers? Gnarly, <laughs> you know that's that's about what we were doing last night. For those that didn't hear it, so it just didn't pan out that well. But we will make better on it later, uh, though. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, it was it was definitely hecticness at its best, and apparently my reaction almost made Mike um, soil himself and urinate himself. So. That being that being said. <laughs> That being said, <laughs> um, Raw Raw actually Raw was it was pretty pretty decent. Um, it actually it actually came to us uh, from the O2 Arena in London this week. Uh, I mean the show was taped uh, because it was you know in London, um, but you know they had to put it on a delay. So uh, Raw GM Kurt Angle wasn't in charge tonight. And uh, we also found out who a number one contender is for the Raw Championship. But uh, before I get into the matches, uh, Chris, did you actually have the opportunity to sit down and watch uh, Raw tonight? Man, to sit down and watch Raw or SmackDown is next to impossible for me with the type of work that I had to do. But I do have it streaming off to the left of me where I can see it. I didn't get to hear a lot of stuff as far as promos go. But I did get to watch a great deal of it. But I did miss a part of the tag team turmoil, unfortunately. So uh, you have to keep uh, get me up to speed on that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was a little faded in and out tonight due to um, personal things going on tonight. But I did my best to keep track of everything that was going on. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But anyway, so Dean Ambrose uh, kicks off Monday Night Raw tonight. 
and uh, it was it was interesting. You know, he comes out, fans start chanting Dino at Ambrose as he addresses the fans in the middle of the ring. But in the beginning, he you see him talking on the phone uh, with somebody, and then you later find out that it's Kurt Angle. Well, he informs the fans that Kurt is not going to be on the show tonight before announcing that he's going to be acting as Raw GM tonight. So, the, the, <laughs> Raw is in the hands of the leader of the asylum, more, of le- more or less. Ooh. That could uh, go a couple yeah. different ways, couldn't it? it? It really, really could. But, that's not all. As Dean continues to talk about how tonight's show is going on, or what is going to go on tonight's show, the Miz's music hits. Now, for those that live under a rock or have no idea what happened last week, The Miz is now the number one contender for Dean Ambrose's Intercontinental Championship, which I, deep down inside, had a feeling that was going to happen. But Miz comes out, he berates Ambrose, as he always does, you know, as he makes his way down to the ring, saying that anybody would have been better than uh, than Ambrose. Well, The Miz then informs Dean that he had gotten a phone call from Stephanie McMahon, which <laughs> drew an immense amount of chants from the fans in the O2 arena of delete, delete, delete. And the last time we saw Stephanie, it seemed to look like she got deleted by her own husband at WrestleMania. Took quite a fall to that table. Uh, yes, and I still say she looked beautiful. Uh, but yes, I'm I'm learning to uh you know P G era. <laughs> Actually I think right now it's on the P G thirteen as uh spectrum right now. Maybe. Not much anyway. of a difference in the two. No, not at all. But so the Miz informs us that Stephanie had named him the co GM for the night. Miz then said that the Raw, fan, the Raw finally had a GM who was awesome. Ambrose replies by telling the Miz to enjoy while he could because Extreme Rules was right around the corner. And the Miz pretty much rubs in Ambrose's face that he's already beaten Balor, he's already beaten Rollins, which in turn makes him, you know, the number one contender. So Ambrose tries to offer the Miz a handshake which The Miz actually started to reach for. But then Braun Strowman's music hits. And, yeah, Strowman comes out with one arm in a sling. And as Strowman's music hits... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, they said last week he had that injury from that. that that's supposed to be his injury from the pay-per-view where Rain slammed the door of the ambulance on his shoulder a couple of times. Right, torn rotator cuff. And that's what it was, torn rotator cuff. But it's kind of ironic because Titus O'Neil has posted photos on Instagram, which have been removed. Oh, he removed them very Italy quickly. On the European <laughs> tour. Oh, yeah. Uh, wait. Aren't there the two feuds going on right now? Heath Slater and Titus, and, you know, the major feud of Heath Slater and Titus O'Neil, and then the slightly minor feud of Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman. You know, it's, and uh, that quickly got I, deleted. I, I don't know if it's crazy to say this or not, because kayfabe has been dead for a while, right? Everybody knows that the guys are just entertainers. They're all friends off camera for the most part, probably. Some of them may not be for real. Who knows? But everybody knows the kayfabe era is dead and gone, and it's not that big a deal anymore. But for the uh, sake of wrestling itself, in your mind, do you still want to see these guys not in public together if they're feuding with each other? Or do you, or do you carry their way? Well, you know... It's it's a tough call because it's cool to know that, that people do have friends, people do have lives, you know, and everything backstage. And, and you know that, you know, whether there's a feud or not, just like Mojo Raleigh, 
post the photo up of him between Natalia and Charlotte on the flight. It's, it's right. bound to happen. You know what I mean? Like, you can't expect them to separate half a locker room, you know, onto one tr- mode, uh, form of transportation and the other half of the locker room on the show onto another form of transportation just to separate, you know, the heels from the faces, so to speak. So you're going you're gonna to know, I mean, any more back then, back in the day before the Internet and everything, um... I don't know. It, it's just really tough because there is the kayfabe aspect. People do understand that a show is being put on. Um, yeah, true, true. I mean, you know, they, they, you know, Jim Cornette is a big advocate of even though kayfabe is dead, trying to keep something sacred in wrestling. Still, that's his thing on it. Um, Paul Heyman's been very criti- uh, very critical of him over the years because if he's not moving forward with everything, that's their big beef with each other these days, apparently. But, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he, said, he said himself that when it comes to being seen in public, if I have a feud going on with this guy over here, you can follow me all day long with cameras and everything else if you want to, and you'll never see one picture of me with that person. You know, it's not a hard thing to do. He says you just don't go out in public with them. That's it. If you call them on the phone and talk to them, great. You know, if you see them backstage where nobody else can see you, great. But when you're on the road, you don't eat together. You don't drive down the road together. You don't be seen in public together. And that's a part of keeping some of that magic still there. Now, I can kind of agree with him, and I would agree with him wholeheartedly if kayfabe was still in effect. But since it's not, and everybody knows uh, that it's not... You know, a big deal. It's not that big a deal to me, but from a kid's perspective, if you look through a kid's eyes, a kid's probably wondering why those two were together like that when they just got done beating the crap out of each other just a week before or something. So that that might not be good as far as that goes. Exactly. I mean, it's just one of those things that people understand it's entertainment, you know, storylines, everything like that, because one minute, you know, it's, for example, Rollins and Reigns. They're friends. They're enemies. They're friends. They're enemies. They're friends. They're enemies. It's going to happen. So you can't expect them to not, you know. Uh, they're frenemies. I don't know. Hang out. Hang out together to an extent. Right. So it's it's one of those things that WWE needs to realize that people aren't stupid. We know what the hell's going on. And and if they're trying to hide it from little kids, you know, little kids aren't on Instagram. Well, you know, you'd be surprised. Some are. But at the same time, if you're going to base your entire business around little kids only, then you're going to find yourself going down the tubes pretty quickly. It's not the kids that spend the money at your thing. It's the parents that take them. And you're not going to see a lot of parents taking their kid to something that costs so much money when they get there that often when you just pander to the kids only. If you're not keeping the adults interested at least, then you're going to find that they're going to stop coming as as often pretty much. The shows won't be as big. You'll find yourself going back to smaller uh, venues and what you've been in or what you're used to being in the last few years and it's just not going to work out in the end mm. well they need to you know they need to just like I said they need to just realize that people aren't dumb and just let things play out the way they play you know and it's just not going to it's not going to change as long as Vince is running things but from my understanding, Vince is has not been at Payback. He hasn't been at Raw. He hasn't been at SmackDown. Um, he like the past two weeks could be taking some time off. Could be trying to see what it would be like letting other people run it without his input at that point. Never know. Right. Well, speaking of of how it's running it, you know, I don't want to stray too far off the subject. Um, I want to I, I want to get back to to these segments because we're just at the beginning segment here. <clears throat> um, 
you know, Strowman comes out. The fans are chanting, you know, thank you, Strowman, for obvious reasons. Strowman beats Reigns at payback, and he says he wouldn't be done until um, – he wouldn't be done while Roman could still walk, basically. So he wants to end Roman for good. Um, he then informed Dean Ambrose the Miz to inform Kurt Angle that he wanted Brock Lesnar after he was done with Roman Reigns. Now, the rumors are circulating that it's supposed to be uh, Roman Reigns, I'm sorry, Brock Lesnar against either Finn Balor or Braun Strowman at Great Balls of Fire. Oh, God, I can't believe I just said that. It just makes me want to throw up. Uh, what kind of a title is that? Where are they getting this stuff at? I I, I don't even know. It's it's beyond me. Mm. You know, um, but anyway, he he basically, you know, was saying how he wants Brock Lesnar, wants the title, you know, wants to destroy Roman Reigns before that. But it's just, he's got to wait in line. So at this point, Kalisto's music hits, and he comes out and basically states how Strowman needs to not worry about Roman Reigns. Strowman has already lost to Kalisto. And Kalisto was basically like, you know, it was a technicality, which we've had this debate before. Dumpster lid closed, dumpster lid open. Is he just go in the dumpster? Does it have to be closed? Nobody really knows. You know, the old days, the lid had to be closed. New day, who knows? But he challenges him to a match later in the night. And he said even after he beat Strowman in a dumpster match, Strowman had been unable to take it like a man. And those were his exact words. Well, after the match is officially booked, um, Strowman says, you know, he can't compete. He's got one arm, he, you know, blah, blah, blah. He don't want to compete. Well, he's stuck in the match. Mm-hmm. After the match is booked, Ambrose then puts The Miz in a match against Finn Balor for the opening match. Now, what are your what are your opinions on on the way that opening segment played out, Chris? I, you know, uh, I, I guess it played out okay. Uh, Dean Ambrose is entertaining. Um, I guess they had to help balance it by throwing the Miz out there and giving you a little bit of the yin and yang there, good and evil, however you want to put it. Uh, I would say it probably uh, worked itself out as having two hosts, as we'll get touch more on later in the show, obviously. Uh, the Braun Strowman thing, I, I I don't know. I mean, does he have to come out every week and tell you he's going to get what he wants? Uh, the only thing different that happened this week that, or that didn't happen this week, that's happened in weeks before, is he didn't stomp off mad and throw everybody around backstage. Um, I I think everybody knows already, uh, for those who keep up with wrestling anyway, that uh, he's going to be in a, a, a big deal with Brock Lesnar eventually here. But uh, just... Have him come out there. I would have done it this week. I would have done it next week. Uh, when it gets closer time to anything, and just announce that he's looking for uh, for Brock Lesnar. If that, I don't know why they don't just go and move on past the Roman Reigns bit with him right now. Anyway, I mean, how much more are you going to get out of the two of them? Technically, I mean, they've had that knockdown drag out where he got carried back to the ambulance and he, you know, tore up his arm basically. Back there, I mean, what, what more can they do with each other? I, mean, I don't know why you want, they want to keep pushing that storyline there. I would go straight to Strowman and start building up him and Lesnar here, if I could. But that requires getting Lesnar on the show too. So, right. who knows? Who knows how that would work? I mean, it's not going to be that great if all you get is Paul Heyman come out and try to talk to Strowman. You're going to have to have. Lesnar there, you're going to have to have a confrontation on Raw where there's going to be some some physicalities involved. Uh, These are two big, huge guys. You can't just go off talk alone. It's not like building up a Goldberg and Brock Lesnar repeat match. This is something that hadn't happened before. they got to have some bad blood with each other going to that main event, that pay-per-view. And I agree. You know, I think that if you give Strowman and Lesnar a mic against each other, I think it'll work. 
I mean, they don't necessarily have to give the mic to Lesnar if they don't want to. They can still have Heyman talking, but, I mean, you need to have Lesnar present in the ring at least. It's got to be something interesting. Something's got to set them off, and they got to go at it for a bit. That's the only thing I can think that would make that worthwhile at that point. If you're just going to build up four weeks or five weeks or however long it may be that they reach that point and uh, not have either one of them have any kind of confrontations with each other. They've had one so far, and it was Strowman backing off out of the ring. And that was it. People wanted to see him go at it that night. But you weren't getting that. Right. Um, you have got my understanding. Lesnar's got at least two appearances before Great Balls of Fire, and that's supposed to be his first match since winning the titles at Great Balls of Fire. But nobody even knows when it, it, the appearance is going to happen. And they haven't released when the full-blown schedule is going to be. Right. And I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's, it's, it's tough. It's kind of a ridiculous thing for me still to have a part-time champion. I don't, I don't know why you do that. You, your champion should be the face of your company. They should be out there on television each week, whether they're wrestling or not. They should at least be there. And we don't see Brock Lesnar any time, Harley. Right. Well, next you got, you know, the the Miz match. And, um, you know, Miz left the ring immediately as soon as the bell rang. Uh, Miz gets back into the ring. Balor, you know, takes him down. Um, Miz, you know, gets back up, hits uh, Balor in the face with an elbow. Balor, it's back and forth. Elbow, you know, drop kick, strike combo. Well, finally, you know, Balor hits the Miz with an Inseguri, which sends the Miz, you know, flying. Uh, Balor follows it up with a clothesline, <clears throat> which sends the Miz out to the ring. Or, I'm sorry, out to ringside. And follows up with a running drop kick at ringside, which was just one hell of a drop kick. Um, right into the guardrail. And the Miz rolls back, or Balor rolls the Miz back in the ring, goes ahead for the top rope for the coup de gras. Well, the Miz pulls him out. I'm sorry, the Maurice pulls the Miz out, and that's when they end up heading to a commercial break. And so after that, um, Miz ends up hitting Balor with a neck breaker, follows up with a snap DDT, tries getting some near falls. Obviously, it doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> Miz continues pummeling Balor using, you know, anything he can in the ring. You know, every ropes, turnbuckles, every aspect. <clears throat> Balor suddenly, um, you know, fights back out of nowhere, hits him with a Pele kick, to, which sends the Miz to the floor. Balor gets back up on his feet, hits Miz with a running drop kick. You know, Miz, Miz hits him with a boot to the face and climbs up to the middle rope. Balor replies, you know, Kicked it ahead, once again sending the Miz out to ringside. Well, Balor follows it up with the uh, the Pele kick from the apron, or the punt kick from the apron, before dragging the Miz back into the ring. Uh, Maurice ends up getting up onto the apron, and Balor pushes the referee into the Miz, uh, which causes the Miz to head ringside to pick up to the mic, or to pick up the mic. Miz states, as co-GM, he announces... Balor was disqualified for putting his hands on the referee. So now the Miz is playing this whole code GM game. And he's utilizing it very well. Well, as the Miz and Maurice go to head to the back, Ambrose comes out and restarts the match with Maurice being ejected from ringside. Uh, Balor ends up bringing the Miz back to the ring, hits him with the sling blade, then the coup de grace for the win. Mm. I, I thought it was a pretty good match myself. I liked it. It was a great opening match there uh, to start Raw off. Uh, if they had cut back the talk they had earlier a little bit more and put that on a bit sooner, I think it would have been a more successful start to the show. But that was a great match all around. I thought it was pretty slick what the Miz had done. He's got classic heel moves, you know, when he, with things that he does to try and get over as, as as the really bad guy. I mean, he has no issues whatsoever pulling that kind of a, a thing off at all. It was great. Uh, 
You kind of had a feel, though, that Ambrose was going to come out and do something like restart that match. I didn't know he would send Maurice out like he did, but uh, it's always good because that's one person I do get tired of looking at a lot. I mean, it's great that he pulls off a good heel gimmick, and I guess you really can't uh, say she has to go because it's a she's a great heel manager. Does the heel thing the valet always does that uh, distracts the, uh, and gets all the trouble and everything there. But I, you know. They could have left it as it was, too, and got away with it. It still would have been a great match. It is good to see Finn Balor get a win over The Miz, however. I don't know. Well, I'm actually surprised that Balor got the loss last week. I mean, he didn't get – well, uh, he did get pinned. That's right, he did get pinned. But Right. But that was because that was with the uh, interference with Bray Wyatt and everything, right? Right, which it's still weird, but we'll touch on that, you know, later. So, you know, it, you, you go backstage. Now now you're paying to a backstage segment. <clears throat> um, between Alexa Bliss and Nia Jax, and Nia basically challenged Alexa to a title match after Alexa was done with Bailey, and Alexa said that she didn't make the matches but would talk to Kurt Angle about this, and... Nia basically stated that um, until their match, Alexa has herself a new best friend. So now you're seeing an allegiance between Nia and Alexa. Which I feel is good because in my eyes, this kind of reminds me of Sean and Diesel. You know, the little person with the big purse as the bodyguard. You know, at the time, Sean was the IC champ. Had Diesel for right. backup. Alexis, the women's champion, has Nia for backup. And you know that could, that's uh, that'll play off pretty well. That might play off into Nia Jax getting her first championship too later on down the line, kind of like it did for Diesel as well, if you think about it. So that could how we see her get the belt eventually at one point around her waist uh, or on her shoulder, however it goes. But at the same time. Uh, that means, you know, Alexa Bliss having to give up the title to her. And I just don't know if I'm ready to see that or not. I think we should just put that off for a while. A good while. Yes, a good while. Maybe next year at WrestleMania they can build up to it. But, you know, you got to leave the belt on Alexa Bliss. It looks good there. No, of course you would say that. But on a serious note, though... Um, I could see them playing this angle with them two being buddy buddy with her being her bodyguard for a while still. Um, several months, really. I could see it going for that far and playing it off. Well, they, they uh, just, did state, more just they did Bailey. state that. Right. Well, they did state that, you know, Nia Jack stated to Lex, like, what did you mean by, you know, I'm a legit competition? Like, I am a legit threat. You know, so Alexa knows what she said, and Nia is just trying to, you know, you know, uh, pull the whole, you know, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Right. And like I said, there'll be something other than Bailey that'll be going on with Alexa Bliss before it reaches Nia Jax, I'm sure. So uh, it won't just be a Bailey uh, deal there. You may see them trying to insert Sasha Banks again um, against Alexa Bliss because they got a bit of a thing, a little bit of a beef between them as well, you know, so... I could see that happening, and then eventually work its way to Nia Jax. Nia Jax could get mad because Sasha Banks gets thrown ahead of her, and she's beaten you know Sasha Banks plenty of times before, and that could lead to some uh, problems at that point, breaking the two up and pitting them against each other. Right. Well, speaking of pitting people up against each other, now you have Alexa Bliss versus Mickey James tonight. Um. Bliss comes out accompanied by Nia, but um, Mickey comes out accompanied by Bailey. So the two women start off, you know, back and forth at a, you know, a simple pace. Um, Mickey James starts getting, you know, control of the match. She has Alexa firmly in control uh, until um, we go to a commercial break. You know, it's back and forth, then it hits to be a commercial break. Well, we'll get back. Um, Alexa's in charge. More or less, you know, as you like to say, <laughs> the champ's in charge. The champ is in charge. 
Not large, but in charge. Yeah, well, soon it'll be the large one. But anyway, um, you know, we come back. She's got Mickey's arm. She's working on her left arm. Um, she uh, hits J- or James hits her with a uh, hurricane rana, but Alexa ends up hitting back and continues her assault on Mickey's arm. Uh, Alexa misses a jumping double knee, which gives Mickey James a way back into the match. And we know about Alexa's double knees. They're, they're pretty, you know, a pretty solid move. Um, she hits Alexa with the knees, planting her face first into the mat. Nia Jax then grabs James's foot to distract her. So she's utilizing, you know, the buddy system, so to speak. Um, that leads Alexa Bliss to pin Mickey James um, face first into the mat. And then Nia Jax grabs James's foot so that that way um, – it causes another distraction, and Alexa ends up getting the pin on Mickey James. So Bailey then chases Alexa out of the arena after the match, while Mickey continues to beat up on Mickey James. So they're playing the ultimate heels right now. Yeah, and like I said, they they can go a long way with just do if they really want to make something good. I mean, Alexa Bliss doesn't need any help as far as drawing heat and being a heel, that's for sure. But throwing Nia Jax by her side and letting them run together for a while just adds a little bit extra to it. You can't go wrong with that. Right. And I agree. Um, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, there's going to, We know that there's going to be... Um, a rematch between Bailey and Alexa. We know that's going to happen. And right. we already know what route it's going to go. We know that Bailey's going to end up losing it. Well, she's already beat Bailey twice. I mean, she's kind of got her number. It looks like she beat her for the title and she beat her on Monday Night Raw the following night. Uh, it's 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 kind of like Bailey taking out Charlotte. It's just, you know, Going the opposite way for Bailey now. She can't seem to get a win over Alexa Bliss. Oh, I, I, I mean, I agree to an extent. Um, but I don't know. I just, I still feel that Bailey needs a lot of fine tuning. Well, she needs a lot of something. I mean, the, it, it, maybe she needs a little bit of a revamp. Not a change of her character per se, but just something that kind of makes it different than what it currently is. I mean, let's face it. I mean, she's not the girl next door anymore. All her little diary dreams she had written down, she's gone through. She's taken care of all that. Now you're going to do something where you're going to do a grown-up version of Bailey and move on beyond that and have her toughen up a little bit. She can't just keep coming out high-fiving people wearing ponytails and pigtails and messing with the little balloon people that fly up there and dance around for her and everything. They need to give her a little bit of a sense of toughness about her without taking away the thing that the that the young kids like about her as far as the hug thing goes. I mean she's still good to, you know, play that hug nation deal or whatever you want to call it. People have different names for it. But they need to give her a sense of toughness as well when she gets in a match. And she needs to have a little bit of a mean streak sometimes in her instead of when she gets in there. Uh, I think they've done some good jobs with her, though, as far as uh, giving her some different move sets by giving her the flying elbow off the top rope, doing that more often again. Uh, I would like to see her do something other than the the Bailey to Belly, you know, a different move as well to go along with that. Uh, she doesn't even she doesn't have any kind of a uh, tap out move at all, does she? I mean, I've never seen her as a submission move that she's put on anybody. No, she doesn't have a tap. She doesn't have a tap out move. She doesn't have a submission hold that I've seen. Um, and it, and it's a tough call because everybody's, all their submission holds are basically like some kind of arm bar or a cross face or, you know, a figure four or, you know, a, a ground one. The only one that really had a really good, I feel, finisher that was unique and original was Paige with the PTO. Yeah. 
But it, it's the point time. that you know every woman is more or less using some sort of submission as their finisher. What would you give for her to be a finisher if you had your choice for Bailey? What would you make it be? Um, I really don't know. I don't even think I would give her a finisher. I would just, I mean, a, a submission. I'd give her a solid finisher, dude. A solid grapple finisher, or something. I, I want. I'd stay away from the submission because, again, everybody has it. I mean, you look at Natalia, submission. Uh, Nikki Bella, submission. I mean, she's got both, but and I'm still counting Nikki Bella because I feel that she will be back at some point, whether it's part time or not. Um, you look at Becky Lynch, submission. You look at Charlotte, submission. Sasha Banks, submission. Oscar, submission. Emma, submission. You Oscar can go either these... way, I think, though. But she is, she is right. a good submission. But I mean, though. but primarily, primarily, it's submission. Carmella, submission. Every one of them has a submission hold, just about. And you got to keep with something different. Keeps her, keeps her different. We'll see what they do. What they decide to do with it, who knows? But a, a solid finisher, other than Bailey to Bailey, would be ideal. I think. I mean, it's just a, it's just a simple suplex. I mean, come on. She if she had weight behind her, okay. If she was. You know, something uh, at least the size of Natalia. N- Natalia's got enough muscle to count toward weight crashing down on someone for that kind of a slam. Uh, obviously, Nia Jax would do well with a belly-to-belly. You know, it's for her coming out on top of somebody. But, I mean, I, Bailey's just not that big. I mean, there's nothing devastating about that belly-to-belly suplex with her. It's like, it, it would be like taking the Bollywood boys or the Singh brothers, whatever you want to call them, and had them do the double drop kick today for a finisher. Cause it was, just because it was successful in the past with somebody who wasn't all that big doesn't mean it's going to be successful right now. You sir have a big thing for that double drop kick. Well, I'm just saying, you know, Magnum TA was the one doing the belly-to-belly suplex, and Magnum TA was not a big guy. He had some muscle on him, but he wasn't a Lex Luger build, you know what I mean? He was just uh, toned more or less. And having him do that belly-to-belly suplex... Just like Tully Blanchard with a slingshot suplex, they were both supposed to be devastating in the day. Uh, neither one of those would be a finisher for any male athlete out there right now. Neither one of them could be. So I don't see why it should be for Bailey either. It's just you, there's no way of really pulling that off. It's just not there. That's why I said that double drop kick wouldn't work as a finisher today. You couldn't pull it off unless you had something special about it, like it was a double missile drop kick, possibly from opposing turnbuckles, and then that might pull something off for you. I don't know. But they need to do something for her that's a little bit more believable for a finisher. I would settle for the top rope elbow. Why not? Flying across the ring like into the air, driving the elbow down, that should be her finisher over the belly to belly. Uh, I mean, they're going to, you know, you're going to see people change moves all the time. But, you know, I don't want to sit on Bailey too long. Um, because we've still got some more matches to head through. Uh, but we'll definitely touch base on that probably about probably this Sunday when we speak more freely on everything that's going on. Uh, um, so backstage you have Samoa Joe. And he's talking to my favorite girl on the Raw roster, Charlie Caruso. Um, when Seth Rollins blindsides him, and there's basically a parking lot brawl before, you know, it gets split up. Um, excuse me. Mm. Somebody uh, sounds like they well, need a nap. Oh, dude, it's been a very, very <laughs> long day. So the next one is, uh, yeah, you might have to, to fix that situation. Um <laughs> <laughs> so you got your next match. It's, it's Braun Strowman versus Kalisto. Um, Braun Strowman basically takes the, mac, the mic before the beginning of the match, calling Dean Ambrose a terrible GM, and that he wouldn't want to wrestle because he was injured, or that he shouldn't wrestle because he was injured. However, the ref rings the bell despite Strowman's words and hits Kalisto with a massive boot as soon as the bell rings. Uh, Kalisto's just getting dominated. Braun's pounding him in the corner. 
you know, beating the living hell out of him when all of a sudden Roman Reigns' music hits. And uh, he returns to Raw for the first time since he got destroyed by Strowman about a month ago. And the crowd cheered like no other crowd ever did before. It was stupendous. They were like, yes, go, Roman, go. Go, Roman, go. Were they not? Or was I watching a different show? Uh, I think you might have been watching be... a different show. No, they oh. they were cheering. They they were, but it, it's England, and, and, and nobody, you can't trust a British person. Um... Great. Now we'll never get Sorry. Stephen Regal to come on the show. Thanks a lot. Way to go, Ray. <laughs> Stephen Regal? Don't you mean William Regal? What did I say? Did I say Stephen Regal? I did. You That's said Mr. Electricity. You said That's the man. Mr. Electricity, you said Stephen the ma- Regal. <laughs> you said the man, man, Stephen Regal. <laughs> well, Mr. Electricity, Steve Regal is right on my brain, I guess. Yeah, William Regal. That's what I'm talking about. You know what I'm you, – you bloody know who I'm talking about, Okay. He's brilliant. We want him on the show. Now we can't because you talked about it. Thanks. That could excuse a lot of people from England then. <laughs> Anywho. Anywho. Roman Reigns, uh, Roman Reigns comes to the ring. Roman, Roman Reigns comes out, and uh, he starts assaulting Braun Strowman's arm. Hits him with an uppercut or an upper hand as he hits Strowman or Rain. I'm sorry, Reigns gets the upper hand as he hits Strowman with Superman punches. You know the infamous Superman punches, which causes him to get out of the ring. Um, he hits Roman with a big boot, but he's soon attacked again by Reigns, and uh, he starts getting hit with a chair. And basically, the match goes to a no contest, um, but Strowman basically retreats in the end. And I feel that's going to set up for a no holds barred. Actually, I'm sorry, possibly an ambulance match, which was supposed to be at payback, but they opted out of it last minute because they've already they already had a gimmick match. Yeah. yeah I uh, if they do this uh, match you're talking about, if they go ahead and do it, I, I hope they go ahead and call that the last match between the two. Just go ahead and let the, the, the ambulance match be the end-all, be-all to it. Well, I, I'm, it probably I'm getting, will. I mean, I understand you got to have somebody that can face Strowman that's big uh, or can at least look like they can handle their own. Roman's been made to look so strong over the time that he should be able to hang with him, no doubt. But, uh, you know, they got to do something different because that that's going to get stale pretty quick. Although the fans like seeing Roman Reigns getting beat on, so I'm sure they'll never get tired of seeing that. But at the same time, you got to move on to something different, bring a little variety into it. Right. Well, speaking of a little variety, we now have a number one contenders tag team turmoil match. And uh, that's right. It is between. <clears throat> Cesaro and Sheamus, Enzo and Cass, Ryback and Slater, The Club, and The Golden Truth. Now, backstage, Gold Dust basically tells our truth that, you know, they've won gold by themselves, but never together, and that they need to prove that they can do this on their own, and that they can do it at all, you know, so they have something, they're going out with something to prove. Um, but we start off the match with Enzo and Cass against Sheamus and Cesaro. The match goes back and forth, you know. Cash shows off he's one of the few men that can overpower Sheamus. Uh, At one point, you know, Cash picks up Enzo, throws him at Cesaro, and then picks up Enzo and throws him at Sheamus. So, you know, he's using the lawn dart aspect. Um, (laughs) Cash takes control briefly before tagging Enzo, which turns out to be a mistake. I mean, and we've all said it before. Enzo is too small to be in with a lot of these guys. He's not uh, technically sound enough to be to be flying around like this. Well, he soon he soon gets nailed with an Irish curse backbreaker. Um, Enzo finally gets the chance to uh, tag in Cass, but Sheamus pulls Cass off the apron. Cesaro then takes advantage and locks Enzo in the sharpshooter. Enzo taps out. Now, I don't know if you had a chance to catch that part of the match. 
Uh, and if so, what did you think about it? Unfortunately, no. I got to see the Enzo and Cass intro come to the ring, followed by Cesaro and Sheamus, and then I just had a really uh, big influx of calls come into me, and I missed the rest of the tag team turmoil with the exception of seeing Heath Slater get pinned real quick as well. So I missed seeing uh, who got pinned or who, who who gave up or whatever the case was between Cass and Enzo. I just saw their intro and the smack talking that he did on the on the mic and everything. Uh, I figured they lost, obviously, since Rhino and Slater had come out there. Uh, and then it went to a commercial break when the club was coming out, I believe. And that's like all I got to that point there. But, you know, the way as far as uh, commenting, as far as commenting on the match goes, uh, I can I can tell you this. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. It's a typical Cass and Enzo match. Come out there, get the crowd riled up with Enzo talking, uh, his normal stuff that he does out there. He's entertaining. He's funny. And then seeing Cass get a couple of spots with Enzo out there, uh, you know you're going to see that just for the entertainment factor alone, and then they're usually going to lose. This, this is all there is to it with them. That's how they've done them pretty much for a while now. I don't see it changing anytime soon, especially with the thing with the Hardys um, and Cesaro and Sheamus going down like it is. So you know, uh, in my mind, you know, I, I don't know who won the tag team turmoil, but I, I kind of had in my mind it was going to be a Sheamus-Cesaro thing to work out they'd be the ones to win it all. Now, if they did or did not, you'll tell me in just a moment. But um, that's pretty much what I know about that so far. Right. Well, next you have um, Heath Slater and Rhino. And Sheamus and Cesaro basically meet them at the ramp and send Rhino crashing in the steel stairs, turn their attention to Slater. Um, Slater gets rolled in the ring, pretty much gets worked on as Rhino gets to, tries to get to his feet. Slater somehow fights back, hits Cesaro with a heel kick, and but yet there's still no one to tag in. So Sheamus then hits Slater with the flying clothesline before taking Rhino out again, and Sheamus hits the broke kick on Slater, uh, pinning Slater. Basically, it just came down to they took out the main problem of the match. They took out the main competition, and that was Rhino in their opinion and in their eyes, even though I feel Slater is a phenomenal in-ring competitor, but they used the two-on-one advantage. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a smart play to do. Take out Big Cass, take out Rhino, go for the smaller guys. No doubt the better, the best play to go about. So that was good thinking on that for sure. Right. Well, now you've got Gallows and Anderson are the next team out. Um, it, it was pretty good. Um, Anderson hits Cesaro, you know, Tagging in Gallows. You know, it's back and forth. Cesaro ends up hitting a vertical suplex out of nowhere before tagging in Sheamus. Um, Sheamus and Gallo hard fought, you know, two big men. And before Anderson comes in, the club tries to hit the magic killer on Sheamus, but Cesaro comes in and clotheslines Anderson. And Sheamus basically takes advantage and hits Gallows with the bro kick and pinning Gallows, eliminating the club that quick. And what do you think about that? I mean, they're on a roll at that point, man. They're on a hot streak. I mean, it doesn't sound like the matches are taking too long with that much of an effort behind it. I mean, you're getting that big move in right at the right time, especially on the club at that point uh, and going from there. Because to me, I mean, I don't know if you're going to have a weak point on the club. Uh, Anderson's a very tough guy on his own. And, uh, you know, Gallo's, well, huge. So, I mean, I, I... to get the win on them over the after facing the other two is pretty impressive in my eyes there. Right. Um, sorry, I thought you were going to say something else following up behind that. Um, well, you, you have them, you know, but that, now here's the team that you would think would be the surprise, you know, the surprise victor because um, Cesaro and Sheamus have been in it from the get-go. So now you have the golden truth. And they come in guns blazing. You know, they take the fight to Cesaro and Sheamus without a doubt. Um, you know, because they're, they're tired at this point. They've been battling for at least 20 minutes or so. Well, Sheamus targets uh, or tags in Cesaro to try and focuses on gold dust. Um, he then tags Sheamus back in as Truth tries to rally the crowd to get behind them. 
Needless to say, Cesaro and Sheamus, you know, uh, they're they're tagging in and out, cutting off gold dust. Um, in the long run, uh, they get nailed with, you know, a roll-up, and Cesaro and Sheamus end up winning. So now Cesaro and Sheamus are number one contenders. But they try to attack, you know, the Golden Truth after the match, which leads the Hardy Boys to come out and put a halt to that. So now you're going to be looking at Extreme Rules, Cesaro and Sheamus versus the Hardy Boys. You know, I wouldn't have been I, I, I wouldn't have been upset if the Golden Truth had won that whole tag team turmoil. That, but to me, that would have been like uh, the move they pulled off with Brizongo on SmackDown to, to go ahead and push them for a chance at the Hardys. Doesn't have to be a long lasting run, just a you know a match against the Hardys for the title, and then go back and you know refocus back on Cesaro and Sheamus and the Hardys. Something could actually happen in that match if they wanted to, where they come down and cost. Golden Truth the belt so they don't get their uh, opportunity after all and keep them as a part of the whole feud so that could have been okay right there for sure but whoever beats the Hardy Boys though hey good in my book doesn't matter well if that happens you're going to see an eventual lead into the broken theme but I'm not sure how long that'll be You know yeah, what I, I mean? Know. I mean, uh, we keep getting little little hints about it here and there, but I, 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 like I said before, I mean, when it comes to the Hardys doing the broken thing, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, it's I, I'm, I'm glad they're on Raw because SmackDown's been my favorite thing since the brand split anyway, and I don't know if I could have handled them on SmackDown or not. I'm just not a huge fan these days. Not a huge fan of the broken gimmick, um, of what the Hardys do in general right now, so, you know, if somebody does beat them, I'm okay with it. Cesaro and Sheamus, I do like them as a tag team, though. I wouldn't mind seeing them have the belts back on them again. Or actually, I enjoy they their new. With. I enjoy their new look, though. I enjoy the new look. You know, with the jacket yeah. they're coming out with and the sunglasses, yeah. I enjoy it. Absolutely. But well, the next match you got is Seth Rollins versus Samoa Joe. Uh, the match was made earlier due to, you know, the battle backstage in the parking lot. Both former NXT champions, you know, Seth Rollins was the longest. Well, it was the first ever, I'm sorry, first ever. And Samoa Joe was the first ever two times. So those are two massive accomplishments. Well, Joe gains early control as he starts hitting Seth Rollins with co- the strike combinations. Um, but Rollins takes control with his version of the sling blade. Which Rollins, I feel, is a move thief. You know, he's got the, he took the pedigree. He's got, he took the sling blade. He's got the rainmaker, you know, that Kenny Omega uses. Mm-hmm. Which, if you haven't heard Omega's rant on Rollins, I'd, I'd advise looking up on YouTube <laughs> because Omega's pissed. I haven't but, seen um, a rant yet. I'll have to look it up. The only thing I saw was a couple of tweets, and one of them was, uh, well, it, at least I still have my ring music, you know, is what he said. And something else kind of funny about it. Um, but I haven't seen a real rant, though. I'll definitely have to look it up, though. I wouldn't mind seeing that. Well, I'll find it and I'll send it to you. But um, Or we'll get, or I'll get an audio clip for the show that we could play this Sunday. That'll work. Um... Yes. And anyway, yeah, we get that, and we can let the, the fans listen to it for those that haven't had the opportunity. But anyway, so we get back to the match. You know, Rollins gets Rollins catches Joe with a high elbow. You know, it's it's, and he hits him with a uh, blockbuster. Well, Joe replies basically by attacking Rollins' weak spot, his knee, and. uh you know, he's screaming out, let's go, Rollins. You know, let's go, let's go. Fans are chanting as Joe continues to taunt Rollins. Um, Rollins attempts to block the Kikita clutch, hits a jawbreaker, and Joe rolls out. Rollins hits suicide dives. Back in the ring, Joe ends up taking control again and hits a senton for another near fall. Uh, 
Then, uh, whoop, where'd my notes go? There they go. Sorry, I, I type all my notes down on my phone because, you know, it's easier that way. <laughs> um, Rollins, you know, manages to somehow hit Samoa Joe with a falcon arrow. I mean, you look at the size of Joe compared to Rollins. Rollins' knee injury, that's a lot of weight to be holding up with that leg. Um, but in the long run, you know, there's a an exposed turnbuckle now that um, Joe ends up, you know, inadvertently exposing it. Well, Joe sends Rollins sternum first in the turnbuckle and just keeps hitting him with it and hitting him with it to the point that the referee has to disqualify Samoa Joe. Um, but after the bell, Joe hits Rollins head first in an exposed turnbuckle, knocking him out cold and locking in the Coquita clutch. So your winner of this match is Seth Rollins. And in my opinion, the match was a very, very solid match. Um, it was. And I'm, re- I'm really enjoying the feud. I am too, and I think they can continue to have some good matches out of these two. They're not quite done yet, just because of all the different flexibilities they have with each other. Uh, I would love to see you know another good match or two out of them for sure at a pay-per-view and just keep drawing it out a little bit more with them. Some people you just can't keep watching. You know, it's it's the same thing all the time. They can change things up some though between the two of them. That's the great thing about them as in-ring workers. They can definitely do that, and I do look forward to seeing more. Right, and it was kind of funny because Corey Graystar said, I faced Joe in one one time here in England, and Booker T's like, yeah, you, you, you ended your career so you don't have to face him again, didn't you? He's like, hey, I had to do something. <laughs> Did but you like, notice it's earlier? It's a shame because Corey Graves, Corey Graves had a hell, hell of a career ahead of him. You know, he I never really saw did. any of his matches. And, and it's a shame. I, 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 I didn't see a single one of go his on, matches. He, he... Go on to the network, okay? They uploaded um, classic NXT episodes going okay. all the way back to, like, when, you know, Bo Dallas was champion and Seth Rollins was champion. Actually, all the way back to when Seth Rollins was champion. You can follow Corey Graves on there. I mean, look up some of his matches in general online. He's a phenomenal in-ring guy. Long, he's a veteran of the ring. Um, he moves very, very well. He's got this Sid Vicious punk rock look style in the ring with his appearance. Uh, it's just, he looks like he would have fit right into Raven's flock back in the WCW days. And uh, he's just a mean, ground and pound technical kind of guy. I, see I mean, that. his feuds with Xavier, his feuds with Xavier Wood, Woods, his feuds with Neville, his feuds with Sami Zayn. I mean, he should have been NXT champion, but he got taken out with concussions. That's that's the way it goes sometimes, though. Unfortunately, the concussions have put quite a few people down, whether it be just in sports in general. It's not just a bad thing going around wrestling. A lot of great football players got into, you know, got careers cut short due to injuries like uh, concussions as well. So you got to watch out for your health in the long run. Exactly. So, well, now now moving on because I know we're, we're coming down to the the half hour mark. <clears throat> well, you have Jack Gallagher versus TJP, TJ Perkins. Now, at this point, you have Neville out there for commentary. And it's actually a decent match for, you know, what little bit of time it was. But uh, Perkins basically sat on the top turnbuckle and refused to get down at the beginning of the match, mocking Gallagher. Um, And then Gallagher mocked him in turn with doing the dab. So then Perkins, you know, how he is with his ego now, gets down, does the dab in Gallagher's face, and then literally eats a headbutt. <laughs> like, Gallagher just headbutts him out of his shoes. Uh, Perkins then slams, you know, Gallagher's head off the steel steps uh, by tripping him. You know, the match is going back and forth. 
Perkins then uh, puts Gallagher in the butterfly lock, but Gallagher catches him with a kick and lands in uppercuts and flying kicks of his own. But in the long run, um, Perkins goes to go for the detonator kick, and Gallagher rolls him up, and Perkins rolls him up of his own and pins Gallagher. So Perkins gets the best of Jack Gallagher. But at the end of it, you have Austin Aries getting involved and basically put that hanging neck, like pulls Perkins through the, the, the ropes like he does, people, and drops that neck breaker onto the ropes and leaves him laying. And now I, I did see uh, that part of the show tonight, and everything. that was, uh, of course, I've said it before, the 205 Lives I do get into uh, more and more. That headbutt that Jack Gallagher has, it's like his, his signature, I think, for a match. Um, I used to think it was just his comedic stuff, like sitting on the top rope doing that headstand or whatever and threatening to kick him as they got closer. But that headbutt stands out more than anything now. You know it's going to happen some at some point during a match. You're going to see that headbutt come out. And it's always vicious looking and sounding. Like, right. how can he not knock himself out in the process, you think, when you hear it? Oh, I agree. I mean, it just sounds like he's just. It sounds almost like one of Ric Flair's chest chops. Mm hmm. He hits you that hard with it. That's true. I mean, but, I, up- I mean. I, I, I just feel he's being underutilized. I don't know if you had the opportunity to check out the match that I mentioned to you uh, last week or maybe the week before on NXT where it was Tyler Bate versus Jack Gallagher for the United Kingdom Championship. I think that was the week before. Well, did you have the opportunity to look at that, sir? No, I did not. Did not get to see that match at all. I'm telling you, you want to see, you really want to see Jack Gallagher back at where he was in the Cruiserweight Classic, doing the stuff he did there, you know, that phenomenal in-ring competition, then I would suggest doing that. And I feel that they, he would be better utilized in the, uh, the, the, the UK division, so to speak. Well, I'm sure he would, and that might be something we'll eventually see in the future. You never know for sure. When they start moving guys around, uh, you could see him get shifted to there. You may see somebody from another show get shifted to 205 Live that fits the weight class. Uh, in my opinion, that's where Sin Cara and Callisto both belong. But Well, maybe not Sin Cara as much as Callisto. Callisto definitely belongs there. But, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that. And If they ever do break up Enzo and Cass, like you pointed out before, Enzo should probably end up in 205 Live as well. But... Um, yeah, uh, uh, Jack Gallagher to the the UK version of the show and uh, Austin Aries to a main roster, I could see being two moves made in the future, possibly. Right, and I agree. Um, well, then you had, did you manage to catch the next match, Alicia Fox versus Sasha Banks? I did. Um uh, like you mentioned before, we don't uh, had seen a lot of Alicia Fox over the years, and now she's suddenly back in the mix again. It seems like, and the beginning of that match was just more of a hair pulling and cat fight more than anything. It seemed like once they both got in the ring, got going, confronted each other, exchanged slaps. Both of them grabbed handfuls of hair and were slinging each other around. I believe Alicia Fox eventually got the uh, better of her to start with and slung her by the hair to the ground and pulled some moves on her, but. Uh, it ended up being just another Sasha Banks win there in the end there. I don't think you're going to see Alicia Fox ever get put over Sasha Banks anyway. Uh, now, I'm not quite sure if I caught this right. Did uh, Banks not get the pin with that jumping dive off the top rope with the, the knees to the face or something like that? Or did she end up doing something different? Because I saw that move being pulled off, but my stream on the Internet tonight was not very good, and it was choppy at times, and it froze up on me at that point when she dove off on her, and then it come back up, and she was her, her hand raised. So I don't know if that's how she pinned her or she did the bank statement or what happened there. Ray, you still there? Hello, Ray. 
Earth to Ray. Ray, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I lost you for a minute. I'm not sure what happened to you. Could, could you hear me talking about the match a moment ago? Um, no, I couldn't. I for some reason I had no signal. The uh, what I was saying was, as far as the uh, match itself goes, at that point in time, my stream was not very good tonight on the computer, and it froze up right as Sasha Banks dove off the top rope or jumped off the top rope, whatever that double knee. Uh, where she uh, lands on their shoulders or something like that. Did she get the pin that way, or did she do it another in another form? Um, she basically, you know, got the double knees through the top rope, you know, off off the middle rope to pick up the win. Okay, because it, it it locked up on me at that point, and I couldn't see. And then when it finally came up there again, she already had her hand raised. So I wasn't quite sure, but I did see pretty much that whole match as far as that goes. It wasn't bad, but I it just, I don't know. It didn't seem like, it, it, it's not great like the women's matches that I'm used to seeing that they put on with all the new women they've got there and everything. I, I'm not I'm not big on Alicia Fox. I know she was uh, good back in her main time when she first came around and everything, but she's not the equivalent to what they got out there today with the other women as far as talent goes, I don't think. Right, and it's one of those things that she was good for back then. And now that you have, now that you have, you know, far superior in-ring athletes in terms of the females, um, yeah, it's one of those things that she's kind of, not with it now, you know what I mean? And, and it's almost like they don't have a direction for Sasha Banks at the moment either as to what they want her to do. Uh, like there's no real comp- – uh, not that there's no competition, but they got no no angle for her. They're wanting to push with her or anything at the moment it seems like, and I'm not sure why. But uh, whenever they were done with that, uh, they went uh, – I think they had some kind of a commercial for Total Divas at that point, maybe a, a finale of some sort coming up. And it announced that next week they're going to have Dean Ambrose versus The Miz for the IC title. What do you think about that, being moved from the pay-per-view up to TV? Um, to me, it feels like they're reaching for viewership. And if they're reaching for viewership... They know that the ratings aren't working. If they're reaching for viewership, do you think that taking a... Um, a feud that's been done two times over, making it a third just at this point, I believe. Bringing that to television is going to be the thing that really brings ratings to him at that point. I mean, I understand the direction I'm they're sorry, going with it and why they're doing it. I, I, I get the I, I get the reason why they're going the direction they're going with it. I do. Uh, as far as the Miz and Dean Ambrose, they do put on a good show together, a good match together. But have they not done that feud two times over already? And now this is like the third time they put the two together. If they're going for a ratings push for the show, and that's the reason why they'd move it up to a Raw next week instead of having it to pay-per-view, wouldn't they go with something different for ratings other than something that's been seen time and time again? Well, here's the thing. Um, It's fresh on Raw, that's why. It's, I mean, uh, fresh on Raw, yes, being, but not fresh to the WWE universe, as they like to call them. I mean, because anybody who watches Raw watches SmackDown. And even before they watch SmackDown, not necessarily. those some, two Some people may not like – right, but some people may not. Obviously, everybody that watches Raw does not watch SmackDown because the ratings for Raw are probably like a 3.0 each week, anywhere from 3.0 to 3.4 each week, depending on what's going on. And the viewerships for SmackDown are at like a 2.5, 2.6 each week. So you're losing about 500 million viewers or 500,000 to a million viewers that, that are watching Raw and SmackDown. Know what's going on? What's the other part yeah. that are not all showing up on SmackDown? 
which I completely don't You've get. Got... I mean, because you know, SmackDown puts on the better show for the majority of the time it's been out there since they've had the split. I think they watch Raw for the most part because it's been pushed so heavily over the years. Monday Night Raw has always been known as the big show, supposedly. That's going to be the main event kind of thing, and then we got SmackDown. But this is the this is my younger brother SmackDown here. We don't like to show him on the prime time Monday night. We're going to slip him to Tuesday there and let him do what he can from there. But at the same time, the product they got on SmackDown seems to be outdoing what they have on Raw. Even though they don't have that same viewership, keep in mind also you've got an extra hour on Raw that adds to that as well. If we were to look, and I don't know if, if we had these kind of numbers, we probably don't have these kind of numbers available when we have to research this, I wonder what it would look like uh, for a two-hour segment of Raw. If we just took two hours, the first two hours of it, and went from there, or even however you want to do it, just two of the three hours and put that together, what kind of viewership would they have at that point, taking away the third hour? And how it would compare to SmackDown at that point? I don't know. But I would like to. I'm kind of curious to see it, though. It's, you know, it's coming down to the fact that they're not going to stop the third hour because they know they're bringing in money because of sponsorship and commercials and ad advertisement and everything. Well, we know and, they're and not going to get rid of it. There's no doubt about right, that. They'll never no get way, rid of that no third way hour. To break it, there's no other way to break it down. There's, there isn't. It's either you have it or you don't have it. Well, no, the way you uh, – what I'm talking about, though, is break down the viewership by hour. How many people tuned in for the 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock hour? How many tuned in for the 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock hour? How many tuned in for the 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock hour? If you take two of those three hours only and don't and don't include one hour of it, what's the viewership then compared to two hours worth of SmackDown? Is it the same, well, different? I don't know what you're talking about, but my viewership is from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. You know, because I live in we we judge everybody, every place in the world in America based on Eastern Standard Time, there, buddy. Hence, why it says standard. Oh, please, Central Standard Time, CST, Eastern Standard Time, EST, Pacific Standard Time, PST. Central people are the best because we're right in the middle of it all. Thank you very much. You okay? Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, now I understand breaking down the hour by viewership, but that's not going to help either. Because what happens if majority of the viewers are in the first hour and the third hour? Well, what are you going to do with that middle hour? Well, yeah, as I said, so I said take two hours of the show, whether it be the first and last, first two, second two, however, just take two hours of the show and tell me what the viewership is compared to two hours worth of raw. And see how close it is. It may not be that close. It might be closer. I don't know. It'd be worth seeing, though. Well, Just to satisfy my curiosity, at least. What now? Well, no, I, I agree. I, I agree. It's, But there's no way to fix it, realistically, because Vince wants money. Well, that's and we've had this conversation before. It's all about the money. That's why I talked about the pay-per-views, all the extra pay-per-views. It's all about the money in the pocket. Third hour of Raw each week. They could they they could easily cut Raw to two hours and be just as entertaining as it is with three, and have less time to fill in things that don't need just to be filled in and have a more solid show each week. I think. Uh, you talked about uh, so many people viewing already. They're constantly consistent. They're consistently losing viewers every week. They say when the numbers come out, the viewership goes down further and further each week. I, I don't know how long it'll take for it to drop to SmackDown level with three hours worth of time in the books, but it's eventually going to work its way there. So I mean, right. how, how much how much is that third hour worth to you with the extra commercials when you start seeing the viewership goes down? And there's less butts and seats out there that you're having to hide and you know compensate for. I mean, it, eventually it's just going to make more money, uh, make more sense down the road, money-wise and everything else, just to cut it to two hours like it was before and take that third hour away. Right. Well, 
speaking of third hour, we still got one more match, and we're, we're running short on uh, time here, and I would really like to get this one because this was actually, I thought, a great match. You know, it was a pay-per-view caliber match. You had Bray Wyatt versus Dean Ambrose. And um, the Miz and Maurice were there for commentary. Well, it starts off with, uh, you know, Wyatt taking control of the match, which was expected. Um, Ambrose hits Wyatt back, um, sending Wyatt outside the ring and hits him with a suicide dive at one point. Ambrose tries to roll him back in the ring, but, you know, Wyatt hits him with a vertical suplex on the ringside floor. And that that's painful in its own because those aren't exactly thick, thick mats. Right. Um, and Wyatt's in control. You know, he hits Ambrose with a running body check into the corner and hits him with a DDT. Uh, hits him with a headlock and tries to keep Ambrose off of his feet. Now I just realized what I said, and I don't know how you hit somebody with a headlock, but... Uh, I'm <laughs> he sure, hit him with uh, a headlock really quick. He hit that headlock so fast. Yeah, your he hit the headlock. He, he didn't put him in it. He hit him with it. Um, he hit him. He hit him. It's like a guy, he hate me from the XFL. He hit him. That's what we're going to start calling Dean Ambrose. We've got <laughs> we, we, we to make it happen, man. That's going to be our claim to fame. Body Slam the competition right. nicknamed him. He he hit him, and it takes. Yeah, you know, kind of like he hate me, he hit him. That's what I said. Yeah, he hate, he hit him. Hold on, I'm gonna write this down. I was just just reiterating it. I was just reiterating. So you know, for those that may have listened away and fell asleep to your soothing voice, no, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) Please, everybody, listen as I talk in my soothing voice. Ray, I can't say it now because we're PG. (laughs) I might have messed up for the night. I guess here, almost. I'll go ahead and stop where I'm ahead. Go ahead, Ray. Ray Ray is a bleeping idiot. No. He, um, he hit anyway. him with a headlock. He said, let's go. He, he hit him with a headlock. Yes. He hit him with a headlock. Now, he got him in a headlock, you know, tried to keep him off his feet. Well, despite whatever Bray Wyatt was throwing at Ambrose, Ambrose manages to get back on his feet and hits him with a jawbreaker. Um, Wyatt then hits a senton from the top rope and misses yet again. So, Ambrose heads to the top rope. Wyatt rolls outside. Well, what else does Dean do? What does he do best in the top rope? You know, he hits him with a dive. You know, his infamous diving elbow onto Wyatt outside the ring. Knocks them both for a loop. Well, they end up continuing to fight. Ambrose gets Wyatt into the ring. Uh, Wyatt hits him with his cross body. You know, basically his kamikaze dive cross body tackle that he does to his running right. opponent. Well, Miz gets up from commentary, heads to ringside, because he says that he needs to get a closer look at this match to watch his opponent for next week. And Michael Cole, which I find funny because, you know, at one point he was all about the Miz, says, thanks for leaving, Miz. <laughs> gets up, goes ringside, and almost costs um, Ambrose – Immediately, as Wyatt tries to hit him with Sister Abigail. Well, Ambrose, you know, reverses it. They're trading punches on the top turnbuckle at one point. Ambrose pushes Wyatt off and goes to look for a clothesline, but gets met with a right hand from Wyatt. At this point, Miz is distracted Ambrose with the Intercontinental title. Ambrose dodges Wyatt, hits uh, Miz with a suicide dive. And as the match goes ringside, Ambrose or Miz hits Ambrose with the title belt from behind, and Ambrose still manages to kick out. And uh, then mm, Wyatt hits Ambrose with Sister Abigail to pick up the win. So Bray Wyatt defeats Ambrose. Well, the Miz picks up the mic and says, "And your winner, Bray Wyatt." Now I don't know what's going on with these two because they seem to be working a lot of the same storylines together. But the Miz was the one that actually booked this match for tonight. How ironic, right? right? Exactly. Well, he books the match, and then as, as a part of it in the end as well, just like he got helped not too long ago by Bray Wyatt to get where he's at. It's almost like we're paying the favor almost. Right. 
Um, well, the Miz ends up standing outside saying, you know, Bray Wyatt wins and everything. And he's trying to get in the ring, and he's slowly watching Wyatt. Well, he gets in the ring and just starts attacking Ambrose. And raking the eyes, you know, and holds up the belt and says, next week, I'm going to be the Intercontinental Champion again. And all the fans are going to look at me and say, he is awesome, and leaves the ring. Now, my thought is this. The Miz is what? Six-time Intercontinental Champion? Seven-time Intercontinental Champion? Something like that. I, I'm going to go... I'm, I'm going to look that up as I, as I speak on this. But he is a seven-time... or Six or seven-time Intercontinental Champion. All right, here we go. Miz is... One time Deep South Wrestling, one time Ohio Wrestling Tag Champion with Chris Cage, uh, one time WWE, two time United States, four time WWE Tag Champion, um, two time World Tag Champion, Money in the Bank winner. He is the 25th Triple Crown Champion, fifth Grand Slam Champion, two time Slammy Award winner. I mean. And as far as Intercontinental Championships are concerned, six-time. Six-time Intercontinental Champion. The most is held by Chris Jericho at nine. And The Miz still has plenty of time under his belt. The Miz is probably about 35. Oh, yeah, definitely. As a matter of fact, I, 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 I can see Miz him getting it, too. years old. Yeah, you know, I mean, I I can see him getting that title, the the Intercontinental title, that many more times too. Possibly, he's not going to get any real world title pushes anymore. Nothing, nothing serious, I don't think anyway. Which is might be a shame, as good of a heel as he plays, but he's not going to get that world title. So to see him win the IC belt that many more times would not be surprising at all. Right. I mean, in ten years, he could be an eleven. Uh, he could be. He could hold the record for the most. Championships, you know, intercontinental championships in history, and honestly, I'd be okay with that because he is probably the greatest heel. Probably one of the better ones, like I said before, one of the better heels they got on the show for sure. Not that in the least. But in saying that, you know, we're looking at next week. As I mean, like I said, that match was solid. That match was a. Um, pay-per-view worthy match. Uh, but now, now we're coming down on about uh, looks like 10 minutes. So where do you think that this is going to go next week? Oh, I'm sorry, we have about uh, 6 minutes. Where do you think it's going to go sure. about by next week? I, I'm, not, I'm not for sure. I don't know if they're going to have it where they'll build up and have another return match the week after the pay-per-view after all. Give us a little taste of it the week before. Uh, what they plan on doing. Um uh, unless they but got plans the case, to replace that match with something win it? else. But if that's I, the case, you know, does the Miz win it? And then they have the rematch? Or is it because you can't just have Ambrose win? No. And no. then, you know, they face again. I mean, the only thing that can happen is Kurt Angle gets tired of outside interference, and then they play something into the extreme rules. And that's where I, the actual right. defense comes into play. Right. I, you I know, think they, that's play, gonna they play in the whole. Well, hold on. They play in the whole Ambrose, you know, is now legitimately defending his title. You know, now it's going to be two weeks in a row he's defending it, supposedly, or within a matter of days, whatever, whatever the pay-per-view is. It's uh, May, no, uh, it's in June. So you still have quite a while for this build-up. Considering we just got, we're off the, the ass end of, you know, um, the tail end, I should say, of payback. So you still have extreme rules in June. So you have a couple weeks to build this up. I, I don't think they'll let. I, I don't. I don't think Miz. I could be wrong. I don't think he'll get it on uh, the next no, next week's Raw or anything. I think they're going to make it to where uh, you're going to see Maurice do something to get involved with it. And like you said, make some kind of a match stipulation to where that can't happen. Like they'll have uh, Maurice in a cage or something, or they'll have them in a cage together when Maurice is outside and can't. 
play any kind of a factor into it of any kind, that might be something to see. Um, what was it uh, that uh, Jericho and Ambrose did? They had one of what they called an uh, one of the uh, asylum asylum matches, asylum match. Ambrose asylum. Yeah. Maybe they'll maybe they'll turn into an, an asylum cage match to keep uh, Maurice out, and uh, there's no outside interference possible from that, and go from there on it. And uh, have the tables get turned on Ambrose, have him have Miz actually beat him without the outside interference, and in his own match at that. And that will give Miz a lot more stuff to really talk some heavy trash with and everything. That would be, that could work for a while there as well, and then that could extend that feud even longer based upon that, if they're wanting to carry it forward more. Well, one way or the other, I think it's going. It's always a good feud. It's always a good storyline. Um, but now moving on from that, you know, well, we have about three and a half minutes left. Um, Sheamus and Cesaro, I feel, are going to be the ones at the top of the Hardys. They want to push Matt in, in a singles. They want to push Jeff more than anything. Um, but now, talking about championships, when do you think we will finally see Lesnar? Do you think Lesnar will show up at Extreme Rules and interfere because it's an ambulance match and be the one that causes? You know whether it's Reigns or Amber Reigns or Strowman to be put be the cause of them losing that match and being put into the stretcher or into the ambulance, I should say. I don't know. Let's say it again. Lesnar, do you think Lesnar will show up at Extreme Rules and cause interference in this possible ambulance match, which is where I'm hearing it's going, um, where it probably will go? and be the cause of either Strowman or Reigns, whomever he chooses to put an F5 on, um, do you think that's when he'll show up, more or less? Or do you think he's going to show up on a Raw? I, I think it's going to be on a Raw. Uh, pay-per-view, things like that, and someone showing up, it's not really WWE style for the most part. Uh, it'll be on a Raw. It, it, it might be the Raw after the pay-per-view at that, to see it come in the hand. Oh, like no, that. unless that Battleground... Unless it's Battleground, it's Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar, and all of a sudden the lights go out and The Undertaker shows up out of nowhere. Sure, it's not their style. Oh, you know what I mean, though. I, <laughs> I, how often do you see it happen, though, when it comes down to it? It's not a, it's, it's, it's not a very right. big repetitive thing that they've done over the years. So I don't think that they'll go that route with that. I think it's more or less one of those things, especially with the type of character Brock Lesnar plays, <clears throat> It'll be on it'll be on Monday Night Raw when it happens, and he'll do something about it then. But that's my opinion of it, though. Well, right. Well, on that note, we're, we're running down. Um, I just want to thank the listeners tonight for you know tuning in for all that are out there wherever you are. I understand we got people in uh, Japan and England and. You know, obviously the United which, States, which is very cool, by the way. You know, someone another in a foreign country is actually picking up on your show and listening to you. So thank you very much right. for sure. Um, check out, you know, our YouTube page, Blog Talk Radio. I'm sorry. Check out our our you know our page on BlogTalkRadio.com slash Body Slam the Competition and follow us on there. Check out our YouTube page at BodySlamTheCompetition.com where you can see all of our past videos, um, our past interviews, past segments, um, recaps, prediction shows. Uh, follow us on Twitter at BodySlamTheComp. That would be Mr. Adams' page. Uh, mine is Jetsman84. If you want to reach out to me about interviews, um, who you would like to see. Also check out our Patreon page. You can donate there as well. And uh, follow us on Instagram, Body Slam the Competition, and on Facebook at Body Slam the Competition. Um, tomorrow night we'll have our SmackDown recap, and Wednesday I'll be interviewing Matt Sigmund from the Heat Seekers. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. I am Ray, this is Chris, and have a good night.